Okay, thank you very much. Um, apologies for the slightly disjointed title. Um, I was asked to talk about Beyond Steam at Five Decadal Prediction, which is a good topic. Happy to talk about that. But I also wanted to show some results on the impact of aerosols on the warming slowdown. So I will try to cover uh, all of that in 15 minutes, if possible. So I'm going to show some results from new decadal predictions that we've been making at the, at the Met Office. It's a much higher resolution than previously. I shall show some results for predicting the NAO, uh, lead time of one year. Uh, some improvements in predicting Sahel rainfall. Uh, I want to highlight this important issue of the signal-to-noise paradox. This is a really key uh, uh, issue, I think, in, in this. And then I'll talk about the recent slowdown. So just to um, give you an idea of, of, of the resolution that we're running now, uh, on the right-hand side is, is the resolution that we're running for our CMIP-5 uh, decadal predictions. This is a typical one-degree ocean. Um, and this is what we're now running now. This is a quarter degree ocean, and there's been a similar uh, upgrade in resolution in the atmosphere, which is now 60 kilometers compared to about 150 kilometers before. So that just gives you an impression of, of the kind of step change in, in resolution. So in terms of what can we predict with this new model, um, so these are uh, a hindcasts of the North Atlantic Oscillation Index, which is the key, you know, the, the dominant mode of variability in the North Atlantic affecting European and, and Eastern U.S. winters. Uh, so the black line is observations. Uh, just focus on the left-hand side for the moment. So the black, we have the observed time series of the, of the North Atlantic Oscillation. Uh, and the red uh, are the hindcasts uh, that now they start in November, and this is for the first season, so predicting the, the December to January, uh, December to February mean uh, starting in November, so one month lead time. Uh, and, and this result has been achieved before, quite recently, for seasonal predictions, and several groups are now showing this. And, and this plot really just shows that this... The skill extends back to an earlier period, back to 1981, which is the beginning of the kind of satellite era. Uh, in fact, the, the correlations, if you split this time series in two, the correlations of around 0.5 or, or so are, are robust across those two different periods. Uh, you can also see that some recent really strong variations in the NAO are picked up um, by this system. So that's just, uh, you know, just confirming that this, this is, and this is the same system that we're using for seasonal forecasts. So in this kind of decadal prediction system, which is slightly different, uh, we are reproducing the skill of the NAO. Uh, but the new result really is, can we extend that prediction any further ahead? So on the right-hand panel, we have the same type of plot, uh, but now the forecast lead time is 13 months. So it's the same November start time, but we're looking at the second winter uh, of these runs. Uh, again, the black is the observations, the same as in the left-hand panel, um, and the right is the, is the hindcast. And you can see that there is a significant correlation. It's a bit lower than in the first winter, as you'd expect, um, but there, there definitely is a significant correlation there, that even at this lead time. So in the spirit of um, Jeff's talk yesterday, it's, it's not really uh, satisfactory just to have a correlation. You need to have some idea of where this skill might be coming from to have any, any confidence in that. Um, so that's what we've tried to do here. I mean, really, to, to pin this down, you really would need to do um, specific experiments, numerical experiments. Um, but what we've done here is a lagged kind of composite analysis. So if you focus on this, this bottom right-hand panel, this shows uh, the, the, the December to Feb, the, the DJF um, mean, mean sea, level, sea level pressure in the observations uh, following the November um, Nino 3 index, if you like. So it's the, it's the warmest Nino 3 minus the coldest Nino 3 indexes in November. And then we composite uh, the sea level pressure in the following December uh, to, to see if there's a potential impact from Nino 3 uh, on the North Atlantic Oscillation. And you can see that there is, in the observations, there's a kind of a, a negative pressure over Iceland and positive pressure over the Azores, which would be a negative phase of the North Atlantic Oscillation Index. And this, and this association has been demonstrated many times in modeling experiments. So in the middle, we have the same thing done from our first winter experiments, and you can see that this again highlights uh, this potential um, you know, forcing from, from ENSO onto the North Atlantic Oscillation. So this is the first winter. And then in the second winter, we can see the same type of composite, the same signal in the North Atlantic, a negative oscillation, uh, an NAO oscillation following an El Nino type event. <clears throat> so that this is a, a potential you know, source of, of skill of the, of the second winter forecasts. Uh, of course, you, ne you need to demonstrate that the ENSO itself is predictable, and this is what this upper, upper panel shows. So this is the correlation skill for predicting uh, ENSO itself, the, the Nino 3 or 3.4, I can't remember which, uh, index, versus the lead time of the forecast. So we have the first, uh, this is a three-month rolling mean, to the first November to January, going right through to the second DJF here. And you can see that the skill never drops below a correlation of 0.5. 
uh, and actually recover slightly during the second uh, winter. So the correlation is, is almost 0.6 for that second uh, winter. So you know, we, we think this is a, a prime candidate for a source of skill for predicting the, the NEO a year ahead. Another possible candidate is, is um, North Atlantic sea surface temperatures, uh, typified by this North Atlantic tripole pattern where we have uh, perhaps warm over the high latitude and a cold blob and, and warm over the tropics as a well-known tripole pattern. So if we do the same sort of composite idea, um, we composite the, the positive and the negative phases of this Atlantic tripole pattern in the observations. So we composite on November and we look at the following DJF mean and we can see a potential projection onto the North Atlantic Oscillation Index again, here a positive phase of the North Atlantic Oscillation. If we look at this in our first winter uh, hindcast, we see the same sort of relationship uh, whereas if we look at it in the second winter one now, this, this is much weaker or, or non-existent, okay? Uh, and indeed, this, this tripole index is, is not really very predictable in the second winter. So our conclusion from this is that there is skill in predicting the second winter NAO. Uh, it's in, our, in, model, in our model, it's mainly coming from predictions of ENSO, whereas in the first winter, we get additional skill by predicting, you know, potentially get additional skill by predicting conditions in the North Atlantic too. Okay, so Sahara rainfall. Um, so these are now predictions of years two to five, so the lead, lead time of well over a year for these forecasts. And it's, and it's the correlation skill for predicting, um, well, for predict, it's a map for predicting rainfall. So red is a, is a, you know, a higher correlation and demonstrates some skill. Uh, this was done with our AR5 type model, so the lower resolution one. And here in the bottom, we have the latest one, the higher resolution. And what you can see is that in the Sahel region, in our old model, we tended to get some skill right on the western edge of the, of the Sahel, but not propagating all the way across. Um, now, this is consistent with um, predictions of, of, uh, skillful predictions of the North Atlantic, which have been shown many times to affect the position of the, uh, the ITCZ over the ocean and the Atlantic. Uh, and in this model, we got associated predictability of, of hurricane frequency associated with shifts in this ITCZ location. But the, but the information never propagated across the Sahel, as it, as it seems to do in the observations. Whereas in the, new, in the new model, we're now getting that propagation. Um, and Katie Sheen has a poster uh, at the moment out there which you can um, go and look at to try and understand how this information propagates right across the Sahel. So that's a, a potential important development uh, that, that we're getting improved skill with this new version. We don't understand exactly why yet, so that's something we need to focus on. Now, the signal-to-noise paradox, this, this is a really key issue, I think, in, in all climate predictions, potentially. Um, some people have started to, 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 to cotton onto this, and, and some people are not aware of it at the moment, so I wanted to really highlight it here. So if you look at the skill, so this is the correlation again, this is for predictions of the North Atlantic Oscillation. If you look at how much skill you get as a, as a function of the number of ensemble members that you run and then take the average of, so, so this is the skill for the ensemble mean. So, for example, if we have uh, 20 ensemble members, we take their mean, then the skill is, you know, wherever this black line is. And you can see that this skill is quite a strong function of, of the number of ensemble members that you can use. That's potentially okay, um, but, but what's really interesting is this blue line, and, and what we've done here is the same thing, but now instead of measuring the skill against actual observations, we're taking one of those ensemble members as the observations instead of the real observations. And you can see that actually, this, and this is totally unexpected, the model is less able to predict itself than it is able to predict the real world. So our, our interpretation of that is, is that the model is, is responding correctly to um, the drivers, whatever drives the NAO, there is a response in the model, but it's too noisy. So the, the signal to noise ratio of that response is too weak in the models compared to the real world. So that when you take the ensemble mean of lots of model members, you're left with that skillful signal. Um, so this has some important implications. It means we can make some skillful predictions with the models that we have right now, but you need to take a large ensemble and get rid of all the noise. Uh, when you do that, you won't get much variability in that ensemble, so you have to then adjust it in some way. Um, but it also means that potentially there's more skill available if we could run, so we can project this line forward. There's a theoretical relationship that allows us to do that. And so if we could run more members, then we, we should be able to get more skillful predictions. And this is true for the second winter as well as the first winter. Uh, it has important implications for measuring skill. It means that perfect model predictability experiments are not necessarily an upper limit of the skill that could be achieved. This is just clearly shown by this difference between uh, this model-to-model -model skill and the model-to-real-world skill. Um, many measures of skill, uh, like RMS error, for example, or, or um, probabilistic measures, 
will not necessarily pick up that there is any skill there because of, because of the, the too much noise. Uh, it has a, um, implications for attributing events because if the model does not respond correctly to the drivers, then, then the probabilities that are assessed in those attribution type studies will not be right. Uh, and it has implications for how we view the role of in internal variability. Okay, so now I want to just, just come on to this slowdown in, in surface warming. Um, I'm not calling, calling it a hiatus, I'm, I'm really calling it a slowdown because this is um, how it's really identified. If you compare trends over different periods, uh, and this is what this plot does, so this is a, time series, a rolling time series of 15 year uh, trends in, in globally average temperature. Uh, and, and the problem seems to be that if you look at the most recent trends, they're lower than they were in previous periods. Okay. Um, and this is true for all observational data sets, e even, even this Carlytel study that, that suggested that when you em employ more corrections to the observations, then, then, then this um, slowdown is, not, is no longer there. So it really is there. Uh, you can definitely see this slowdown. Now, when I plotted this, this uh, originally this was a bit of a surprise. And what, what this shows is the CMIP5 model simulations with the ensemble mean in red, uh, the thick red line. And, and clearly these are also capturing a recent slowdown uh, in, the, in this rate of warming. The model trends are bigger than the observed ones in general, uh, but they do capture a recent slowdown. So there are a couple of things to explain about this. What, what is it that's driving this slowdown, and why is the model trend bigger than the, than the observed one? <clears throat> so, and, and of course, the fact that the ensemble mean of, of this captures this signal means it's externally forced. You know, this ensemble mean is averaging out the internal variability. So what we can do is look at the model simulations that are forced by different factors in, individually. So that's what I've done here. So the red line is the same as on the previous plot. It's the all forcings, and some of them of, of the models that had all of the forcings in them. So you can see this, this slowdown. Uh, and then I have greenhouse gases in, in pink. So there were quite a large ensemble of models uh, ran just with greenhouse gases. I have the natural forcings only. So this is solar and volcanic aerosol changes. Uh, and then I've put on some models that only ran with anthropogenic aerosol changes. Okay. Uh, and you can clearly see that this, this slowdown is well simulated by this natural ensemble. And, and the reason for that actually is not surprising when you think about it. It's, it's, it's the recovery from Mount Pinatubo. So when Mount Pinatubo went off, the surface air temperatures cooled. The maximum cooling was in 1992. So if you start calculating a trend from 1992 and, and it ends in 2006, then that will be the maximum warming trend that you will get from the recovery from Mount Pinatubo. So if that's a maximum, then every year following that has to be lower. Uh, so that's the primary reason for, for this peak uh, in, in the trends. And that's kind of quite obvious, really. But it, it kind of highlights the, the, the importance of thinking about the impact of volcanic eruptions when you're looking at trends over different periods. Okay? But I think what's more interesting about this plot is, is this blue line, which is the aerosol-only uh, ensemble. And that is also showing uh, a slowdown in, in the, or an increase in the cooling, if you like, uh, from, from these antiplanic aerosol runs. Um, okay. So, much, you know, many studies have highlighted the importance of the tropical Pacific in this, in this slowdown. Uh, so really, if we're going to um, have a convincing explanation that external forcing has played a role, then, then we need to reconcile, you know, what's going on in the tropical Pacific so if we look at the most recent period that we can do in these aerosol-only simulations, they all end in 2012. So this is the most recent 15 years that we can look at. Uh, and we look at the, the pattern of trends, surface temperature trends in those, uh, and compare it with the other forcing factors and the observations. So you can see this kind of well-known trend towards a negative PDO-type pattern in the Pacific. That's definitely not captured by greenhouse gas or natural forcings. But it is captured to some degree by the aerosol-only ensemble. So clearly the aerosols are projecting in some way onto this PDO pattern. Uh, and if you look at other variables that would be important for that, so, so um, kind of variables that affect the dynamics of the, of the atmosphere. So here I've got the sea level pressure. So it's the same trend over the same period now in terms of sea level pressure in the observations and in the aerosol-only uh, ensemble. And you can see this, um, this, this Aleutian low you know, has, has been weakening over this period. So there's an anomalous high pressure in, in this Aleutian low region. It's in the observations and it's in these model 
simulations. And, and in terms of the tropical, um, the, the zonal winds that have been highlighted as a driver for the, for the negative um, PDO type pattern, you can see not in this region that was really highlighted before. Um, this is, this is the, in Matt England's paper, he, he picks a box in this region and demonstrates very large trends in that. And that's not really picked up so well in these model simulations. But there is some broad agreement, as you would expect if there's a, a, a change in the Aleutian low. There's some broad agreement in terms of the zonal wind. So, so the surface temperatures, uh, the sea level pressure, and the zonal winds would hint that anthrop anthropogenic aerosols have played a role in forcing this um, negative PDO type pattern. Now, the, observed pat the, the model pattern is, is weaker than observed, and that's um, something to be explained. But, but, but nevertheless, it is, it is definitely there. Um, so the question is, you know, if, if, if changes in aerosols are forcing this, this dynamic pattern in the atmosphere, how do they do it? Okay. Uh, so that's what I've tried to do here. So on the left-hand panel here is the trend in aerosols, if you like. It's the sulfate aerosol optical depth trend um, over this period, so 1998 to 2012. And what you can see is a reduction over the U.S. and Europe and an increase over China and India. And that's kind of well known that that pattern has, has, has been there. Um, so how would that uh, force changes in the Aleutian low? So to, to look at that, I've taken an index of the Aleutian low, which is this North Pacific index. It's just simply the, the average pressure uh, in, in this box. Uh, so this is a, a, an established in, index. OK, so if you correlate uh, trends in aerosols in these two boxes, so I've picked, uh, I, did, I did other boxes, but I'm just highlighting uh, the American box and the Chinese box, if you correlate trends in aerosols um, with the strength of this NPI, the solution low index, uh, and do it for different lags, this is what you get here in these model simulations, and the, and the shading is the spreadsheet you get from all of the models that, that had an ensemble, there's three of them that had an ensemble of simulations. So you can see that when the aerosols lead, uh, there is a you know, correlation between the Chinese aerosols leading the strength of this solution low index. Uh, and then there's a negative correlation with the American or the, the U.S. aerosols, uh, again, leading the strength of the solution low index. And then if you look at a time series of trends in this index, so, so, so the, the black here is, is just the time series of 15-year trends from this NPI index in the observations. And you can see that it's varied quite a lot over this time period. Um, and then if you compare that with the same index, but in the ensemble mean of the aerosol only forcings, that's what you get from this blue curve. Um, and I think what you can see here is in this early part of the, the period, there's no real correspondence uh, between the aerosol runs and the observed time series of changes in these trends. And, and I, if you look at the time series of, of aerosol optical depth trends from, from China and the US separately, you can see that they didn't vary an awful lot, you know, there's perhaps a little bit there, but they didn't vary, especially over China, they didn't vary very much in that period. But when you get to the middle of the last century, then there start to be some pretty big variations in, in these uh, aerosol trends and emissions. Uh, and you can see that the, these simulations start to come in phase uh, with the observed changes in, in this um, MPI index. So it's kind of suggesting that, you know, these, these these variations in trends of, of optical depth are, are, are affecting uh, the, the solution low um, through changes in, in SST, I think. Um, just one final point on this is that this dashed line is one of these models. This is the Hadley Center model that was actually run out to uh, 2020 in the future, so we can um, assess future trends in this one. Uh, and, and in this one, the, aer the aerosols over China in this scenario de decrease uh, quite a lot. Uh, and in response to that, this model simulates um, a, a, this kind of strengthening of the, of the Aleutian low, which would be a, a consistent with a, with a change in phase of the PDO index. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. So the final point was on um, trying to explain the discrepancy between the model trends uh, and the observed trends. So this goes back to the first plot I showed, time series of observed trends and the time series of model trends, is this dashed line here. Um, in fact, what this is, is, is if you add up the trends from the greenhouse gases, natural and aerosol ensembles, but it's the same, pretty much the same as the all-forcing trends, okay? So what I'm trying to do is explain this discrepancy. Um, and what I've done is a detection and, and attribution analysis on these trends in terms of these three factors, greenhouse gases, natural and aerosol, so which are these, uh, the blue, green, and pink lines, okay? So you take those, those, those 
model simulations and you compute the weights, if the, the weights that you would apply to, to make that set in a multiple li linear regression sense optimally fit uh, the observed time series. And if you do that, these weighting factors for greenhouse gases and aerosols are not inconsistent with one. All of the factors are, are, are significantly greater than zero, so they're all playing a role. Um, but the one that is, is significantly less than one is this natural one. So it's implying really that the models are over responding to these natural factors. And, and a few papers have suggested that they over respond to volcanic eruptions. So if you apply this weight, these weightings to the time series, you, you end up with this dotted line. And I should say that the, these weightings were obtained by uh, on, only using data up to 1995. So it's before the warming slowdown. Sorry, Paco, okay. <laughs> this is the last bit. Before the warming slowdown. So if, you, if, you, if, if we'd been in 1995, we'd done this analysis, then we would have projected uh, the model simulations according to this dotted line, which is much closer to the observed one. So I will leave you to read the summary and take questions. Thank you.